So uh, welcome everybody back to our monthly theology pub night. And obviously we still can't meet together as we used to, but uh, nonetheless, it's great to have everybody here. Uh, yeah, this is a, an exciting uh, debut for our newest uh, faculty member, Justin Stratus. And so I've invited him to come and just chat uh, informally about uh, why theology matters. And um, as everybody knows who's been here before, you can uh, definitely ask questions in the chat. There's also a Q&A function where you can pose your question and that can be upvoted by your uh, fellow participants. And uh, at the end of the session, we'll open it all up and we'll um, uh, have an opportunity to chat face-to-face. Uh, -face. So uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome, Justin. Um, so maybe before we get started uh, into kind of the meat of tonight's talk, uh, Justin, why don't you kind of introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your journey um, to Wycliffe, you know, um, I don't know where to start. Don't start like, you know, in yeah. elementary school, but uh, somewhere in the in the important phase yeah. of your uh, of your life. Okay. Um, well, uh, thanks, Steve. It's really good to be here. I, I wish I could see you guys. Hopefully, I can see you later. Um, uh, and it's good to see some people that I know, like Brett. Um, so I I just arrived here at Wycliffe this past summer. Um, I was living in the UK for the past 13 years um, with my family, my wife and three kids. And um, I spent the last nine years teaching at an Anglican theological college in Bristol called Trinity College, um, where I taught systematic theology and ran the, the doctoral program there. And uh, it was all, I mean, the whole journey, everything about, as all of our lives, everything about this journey has been surprising and unexpected. Um, didn't plan to move to the UK to do my PhD, but we ended up doing that. That was supposed to be a three-year adventure, and it turned out being 13 years. Um, didn't expect to stay to teach uh, at an Anglican college. I converted to Anglicanism whilst in Scotland. Uh, and ended up getting very involved in that particular denomination, first in the Scottish Episcopal Church and then in the Church of England. And um, and I was intending to stay there for a really long time. Um, and uh, this job description, some so a friend of mine who's a priest in Canada sent me the job spec for Wycliffe, and it was like everything I had ever wanted out of a, a college. Um, um, you can quote me on this later on when I'm all, um, you know, disgruntled and angry. But right now, I thought Wycliffe is is everything I wanted. I wanted to do theology for the church, so I didn't want to work in a university um, and just do things academically. Um, I wanted to, even though I was working in an Anglican theological college, um, and I am Anglican myself. There, it was a bit too Anglican in certain respects. And I think um, part of what gets me excited is interdenominational ecumenical work. Um, so when I learned about Wycliffe being Anglican, but serving tons of different constituencies and denominations, I thought that sounds like a really healthy thing. Um, Wycliffe gave me the chance to work with doctoral students was a real passion of mine. It's evangelical. It was committed to reading the Bible theologically. So I showed all of this job spec to my wife and she said, uh oh, we have to apply for this. We did on a whim and next thing you know, we're moving all our stuff to Canada where I'd never set foot before, even though I grew up in the Northeast of America. I'd never been to Canada before. Um, uh, all I knew about it were probably um, incredibly inaccurate stereotypes and um, there and uh, we're preparing to be here for a long while. Um, so that's how I got here. I can talk about theological stuff if you want later on, but maybe- Well, let's uh, back up here. You made a statement that I thought was interesting. Yeah. So what's one stereotype that was true and one stereotype that was totally off? I'm kind of interested in that. Well, 
<laughs> Again, I, um, so I did work very closely with a Canadian, with a couple of Canadians, um, uh, but they were from the prairies. So their description of Canada was, you know, huge mountains and wilderness and all of this. And so I, again, I don't know. So I'm like, oh, Toronto's probably like that. Um, and then I learned, no, it's not like that at all. Uh, so that was a surprise um, for me. Obviously, I started Googling and learning these things. Uh, the thing that turned out to be true was your, your incredible obsession with Tim Hortons. Um, it's weird. It's eh? everywhere. I mean, you can't not, you can't avoid tripping over a Tim Hortons. Um, and I'm trying to get into it. It's very good. It's cheap, which I like. Um, that that bore out. I mean, it's it's a religion here. <laughs> Great. And like, I understand too that you were a musician earlier on in your life. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of switched from one high paying profession, music, to another yeah. one, theology. Um, yeah. So what was kind of what what kind of triggered that like wh why the why the shift yeah um well i it's odd that i even studied music i was a musician so i studied music in university uh and that kind of saved my career because i was not interested in university at all um and then someone suggested why don't you study something you actually like so I said, okay. I remember telling my grandmother I was going to be a music major and she, uh, old Greek woman, she said, um, you know, I just pass these homeless people on the street and it's just so sad. <laughs> they just have no place to live. And anyway, what were you talking about, Justin? And um, so she was convinced it was a horrible move um, because when you're an immigrant family, your job is to become a doctor or a lawyer. Um, some of you might relate to that. Um, so music not allowed. So I did music and I ended up doing really well academically at it. And I was working at a church as a director of music and playing around at different pubs and things. And I stumbled into a Bible class by accident. Um, I, I was in summer school in my uni and I had to take a general class on history or a general class or something. So I took off of work, I was working at the time and um, went to this history class and there was not enough enrollment for them to have the class. So I had two weeks with nothing to do. So I literally walked across the corridor to this other class that was happening. And I said, what are you guys studying? Can I join it? And he said, sure. And it turned out to be a class called Bible Doctrine. And in that class, I was just blown away that, um, that Christians actually thought about things they believed and had reasons for them, and that it emerged somewhat organically from the Christian faith rather than just being some kind of set of abstract things that I was obligated to believe. And uh, I just kept taking classes in theology whilst I was doing music, and then I started taking classes in Greek, and um, by the end of university, I was just, I, I just wanted to go to seminary. Um, I didn't know why. I had no career intentions. Uh, I thought maybe it would help me be a better music minister to sort of know about the Bible and things. But I just kept going, uh, kept asking questions. And um, a few years later, here I am with a PhD, uh, you know, busking for work to do theology. And that's what I do now. So it was really organic. It wasn't a plan. It's just sort of the more I asked questions, the more I became interested in how deep the answers could go. And I just became really fascinated by the subject. Do you feel like it made you a better minister? I think, I think it did. I mean, what it gave to me was this impulse for self-criticism. Um, I remember when I was working in churches, uh, they put you on a stage. They don't call it a stage, but it's a stage. And um, when you're on that stage, people just assume you know what you're talking about, right? If you're, if you're up there talking competently about scripture or anything about God, people just think, well, he's higher than me, elevation-wise, ergo, he probably knows what he's talking about. And you can listen to your own press and hype uh, in that place uh, and get sort of unearned confidence in speaking of God. 
And the more I study theology, uh, I feel like I'm more competent now in speaking about God, but I also recognize just how dangerous and humbling it is to do that. So I'm, I'm much more careful now in, uh, and qualified in what I say. So I think it's made me better in that respect where I'm not just, I mean, you really have the capacity to lead people astray, I think. So I'm, I'm more confident now that maybe I'm not leading people into too much heresy. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's helped. Yeah, I guess that segues a little bit into our topic for tonight. Like we were kind of trying to figure out what we could chat about. And yeah, from time to time you hear, you know, you know, you, you've said some of these words, you know, like, oh, theology is this abstract, you know, yeah. thing. It's just like a bunch of people in a university talking about things that don't really matter. Mm -hmm. um, there's people that are kind of... Um, despairing that the church is is losing its you know theological you know edge in some ways that we've become very shallow you know in, in the way that we think about the things of God and and those things and so yeah I just thought it might be a cool opportunity just to explore why theology does matter you know and why it is actually relevant to our lives but also to the church and the witness of the gospel um, in our in our world. So, yeah, thanks for coming out tonight, and and hopefully we can have an interesting conversation. So, people um, on on Zoom here, if you have any questions around that theme, um, we totally welcome that. But um, yeah, I guess uh, why don't we we start off? You know, in your kind of you know, experience in the Church of North America, you know, uh, theology seems to be on the decline or the, the um, I guess, the theological awareness of the average congregant, you know, seems to be on decline. And as you said, said you know, yourself, you know, you know, through social media and through, you know, television and all these other mediums, people that speak confidently, who have a platform, you know, yeah. of some kind um, are, are revered and, and admired and believed, you know, on mm -hmm. the basis of that. Um, I guess like what, what's kind of your thoughts on, on kind of the trajectory of the church in regard to theology um, and, you know, why is it important that we care about that? Um. Well, that's a, that's a big question. Um, I think, well, I'll, I'll, uh, let me frame this uh, the best I can here. I mean, I think our number one job as Christians, if we are Christians, is uh, to follow Jesus, right? So everything that we do ought to be a refraction, right? Or an aspect of that one thing. I always love that. Um, that uh, quote from Jesus when uh, uh, when he's sort of chastising Martha for running around and being mad at Mary for not helping. This is the family in Bethany. And, um, and Jesus says, you know, Mary has done the one thing that is needful, which is to listen, right? What does a disciple do? They listen to their rabbi. Um, so, for theology to count, it needs to be a species of that sort of thing. It's not always that. Uh, I think particularly in the last few hundred years, theology has tried to present itself as just another academic discipline that deserves a seat at the table at say the university or whatever. Um, and it, it can be that, but it can't be that to the subordination of its primary function, which is listening to Jesus, the teacher, by the Holy Spirit. Um, what I mean by that is, um, now imagine if you think of theology in those terms, uh, it wouldn't be a matter of figuring things out. It wouldn't be a matter of being clever. It wouldn't be a matter of being innovative or creative. It would be a matter of trying to listen as best we can through the various media uh, that Christ speaks to us through. 
So obviously the Bible, one another, history, and all sorts of other unexpected places. But if you have that mentality of listening, theology, I think, can get off the ground. Um, the reason why theology is necessary is because we are not always good disciples or listeners. Right. So if we were, if, if we could hear Jesus Christ speaking plain as day to us in all things and not deceive ourselves about what he's saying and not listen to any other voices in the world, then we can trust that our theologizing, our, our understanding of Christ's word uh, were true. But unfortunately, we're sinners. So theology is us testing ourselves, right? Asking the question, Am I really hearing the voice of Christ or are, uh, are other voices whispering in my ear? You know, one John says uh, to test the spirits, right? There are other spirits out there speaking to us. And we need to ask that critical question, right? The thing I think uh, God is saying, is that really God? Theology is basically that to me. It's, it's, um, it's asking that question. Uh, what has God said, right? And why do I think that is God saying it? Uh, and then once I understand that, to obey that word. Um, that requires a certain set of skills and moral practices, I think. Um, obviously, knowledge of scripture, in my mind, is paramount to that. When you talk about lamenting the place of theology in the church, I think one of the reasons we see that fact is the uh, the diminishment of the place of scripture in the church. Um, just literally knowing what's in it, first of all. Um, when I was working in Britain, uh, we have to interview every student who applies uh, for theological college. And one of my questions, and these are people heading into Christian ministry, and uh, the question I ask all of my interviewees is, have you read the whole Bible? Uh, and um, they, a lot of them claim to, right? And that was kind of encouraging. But my point was, uh, don't try to think you can do ministry or do systematic theology or any other topic if you don't know the book, right? And I think churches play a big role in giving people the book, right? It doesn't have to be in a smarty pants way. It just needs to saturate the life of the Christian community. And once it does that, I think you'll find it's almost like uh, turning up the hearing aid for your congregation. It helps people to test the spirits and hear the spirit better um, the more they know scripture. Um, and that will help them do that work of self-critical reflection that I think theology is. Um, it's also a matter of getting to know our history, getting to know our forebears. Um, people sometimes ask me what I do for a living. And I say, I introduce Christians to their grandparents right? These, these family members that have preceded us um, in all times and all places all throughout the world, um, we need to benefit from their wisdom as well. And listening to them also helps us to hear better the voice of the rabbi. Um, and, and that's basically it. Um, learning how to listen better and speak in light of what we hear, speak and act in light of what we hear. Yeah. And it's kind of hard sometimes because, you know, in our in our very multifaceted culture, there's so many different opinions on everything, right? Um, how do we even arbitrate, you know, between, you know, different people we hear and different people we, um, I guess, uh, interact with? Um, and there is a prevailing, um, I guess, pressure that society puts on us that you know, religion really is your own, you know, and make yeah. it what, make it what it would be for yourself. And, and so there's no, so everybody can kind of have their own version of theology yeah. and their own version of truth. Yeah. Um, like, how, how are we supposed to kind of combat, you know, that, or is that a good thing, you know, to have, you know, this, uh, this sentiment? This I mean, I think it can be a good thing um, if we all regard ourselves on the same team in the pursuit of truth. Um, uh, I I can't. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. Um, 
Uh, old professor of mine used to say, I'm not a, son, a prophet or the son of a prophet. In fact, I work for a nonprofit institution. Um, but um, so I, that means I can't be, I don't have enough <laughs> personal confidence to be like everything I think is of God and is true in this world is true because I think it and I've convinced myself Right, I need to subject what I think to public discourse. Um, first and foremost, as a Christian, to my brothers and sisters in the church, but even wider afield than that. I don't think Christians need to be afraid of listening in general. Um, what worries me is when that listening exercise becomes um, diversity for diversity's sake. Right, we're not thinking um, we to get all our, you know, all our pluriform character as a people, as a society is a good because it helps us work together to either make society better or to discover truth together, or discover justice together, where we just stop it and saying diversity is a good full stop, the end. Um, that's when things become rather aimless. And that's where you get, I think, Things like, uh, I mean, the, the shadow side of that approach is precisely religious and political conflict, right? Where there's, there's no space for others because I've convinced myself that my view is, is entirely correct. So, yeah, um, I guess there's a flip to that too, like the extreme opposite end that some might feel there's a hopelessness. You know, there's too many ideas. I can yeah. never know yeah. what's actually true. And so what's the point of even you know, trying to some degree, right? It's yeah, it take it takes a good dose of faith, I think. I mean, this is answering from my Christian perspective. Um, Jesus says in John 14 uh, to his disciples who are in the middle of freaking out because he's just said he's going to leave. He says, I am not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to give you the spirit who will remind you of everything I said and guide you into all truth, etc." So either he did send the spirit or he didn't, right? If he did send the spirit, I can trust that no matter how confusing things are, I'm not utterly adrift in the sea by myself trying to figure this out, but the spirit is going to guide me uh, if I avail myself of the spirit. Um, and sometimes even if I don't avail myself of the spirit. Um, so yeah, it, it's going to feel confusing, but we take comfort not in our own cleverness to figure things out, but in the presence of God with us, I think. So somebody asked uh, a little bit uh, a few seconds ago um, about mm. the intersection of theology and spiritual disciplines or formation. Um, yeah. yeah, theology tends to be an intellectual exercise, yeah. right? Great question. Um, yeah. Yeah. So maybe uh, what's what's your thoughts around, you know, the practices, you know, the the, the historical practices of the church mm -hmm. or some of the embodied acts that we do as uh, followers of Jesus that can influence how we think about, you know, theology. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, I think this is a great question. And um, um I think for me, everything is just one thing, right? We're living a life, right? So what we separate out in our minds is probably not separated out in reality. And one of those examples is the divide between theory and practice, right? This is a pervasive thing, uh, particularly in the modern era. Uh, on the one hand, we have ideas, and on the other hand, we have actions and they can be hermetically sealed from one another, or they're awkwardly related to one another. Like, um, uh, I have a theory, and then I apply it. Or I have a practice, and then I explain it. Um, I think everything we do is action in the world, right? So um, uh, to combat this issue in congregations, I think requires doing away with this false distinction that there is such a thing as a cerebral realm uh, to for which we are not ethically responsible and then an ethical realm which is just sort of feelings and mm -hmm. and stuff um, it's all one right we are all we're all equally responsible to Jesus Christ in all aspects of our lives or I would say for our life 
So to get people to understand the value of theology, they need to see it as an act of discipleship, right? The same as um, I probably shouldn't steal something today, or I should probably say a kind word to my colleague who needs it, or I should pray. Uh, they need to understand theology as I need to reflect on the word of God, or I need to, to challenge myself. I need to test the spirits. I need to read Augustine. I need to read Luther. I need to read Thomas Aquinas and all the, the others. And I need to read people, you know, in the contemporary world as an act of discipleship. It's me doing something when I study theology. Um, sometimes I'm asked to speak on uh, spiritual gifts in churches. Um, they'll do like series. It's always like Richard Foster's list of spiritual disciplines and stuff. Sorry, I meant spiritual disciplines. And they always give me study because I'm like the, the lecturer guy. So uh, Justin talked to us about the value of study. Um, and I always try to talk about it in a way that doesn't imply that you have to become me. Like you have to go full time into academic study to, to, to exercise this spiritual discipline. Study for me is simply paying attention really carefully to something, right? And everyone can do that. If something matters, you pay attention to it. You ask questions, right? Um, if you're trying to figure out if you want to marry someone, you think very carefully about that because you realize it's a huge decision, right? If you want to buy a house, you learn all about house stuff before you buy a house. If you want to follow Jesus, you will think about it and think about all it implies for your life and all it means and the meaning of your confession, et cetera. That's what study means. And if I can, I, I think I can convince regular old uneducated Christians that it's worth thinking carefully about what it means to follow Jesus. That could look different from everyone. To everyone, that doesn't mean learn Greek, you know, or read the Summa Theologiae or any of that. That could just mean um, learning how to pray better and asking myself, what is good prayer? You know, what am I doing when I pray, et cetera? How can I get better at that? And just asking the critical questions. That's theology in my mind. Yeah, here's, here's an interesting uh, question. Um, yeah, I guess like part, part of the challenge, um, like we as humans, you know, as you, you said, we're sinners, you know, and, and we don't get it perfect. Um, and the church as an institution often can let us down, you know, and so uh, I think that puts pressure on our relationship with God, obviously but also our relation to theology and doctrine, you know, because I think we see sometimes it's, you know, these dogmatic ideas that churches hold on to that kind of create those yeah. situations. So um, one of the participants asked, you know, that they were raised in an Orthodox church, um, but they had left the church due to some abuse mm -hmm. and they're finding it hard to like really reconnect in, you know, and what kind of advice can you give to somebody that's kind of gone down that path and had, you know, a real um, hard experience with the church, you know, and because of that, are, are finding it hard to connect with God? And how do you rekindle that, um, you know? Oh, gosh. Um... I don't know how to answer that really in a general kind of way. Um, I think, the key, I mean, I'll answer it in a theological way about that. Uh, um, the key, uh, I agree with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who says that um, the key to other people is, or the doorway to, to fellowship with others is through Jesus. Um, I think often he says, the problem is when we try to have unmediated relationships with one another, we try to get to know other people uh, exactly one-to-one. -one. And he says that um, for complicated reasons ends up making you trapped in yourself even more. Um, he says, if you really wanna know someone else, if you really wanna be in a real reconciled relationship with others, you need to go through Jesus Christ. So I think, if someone is, is feeling alienated from the church, rightly so in some cases, 
um, the key to healing is not maybe first and foremost jumping back in, but reacquainting oneself with Jesus. And if you know, if you know you're right with Jesus, he opens up the world of others to you. Um, it's probably what I would say theologically. Now, of course, in individual situations, these are incredibly complex situations. So uh, I wouldn't, if you're listening right now and you're thinking this really applies to you and should you take Justin's advice, that's not Justin's advice. That's the general rubric uh, in which to think about it. But I would turn to people that you care about and trust and see what their assessment is also and pray about it if you can. Yeah, and I, I feel for people that are, you know, find themselves in those situations and there is an, an unfortunate amount of that that happens, you know, all yeah. over the place. But I think there is also some really good places, you know, in the church and there are real safe places that you can find. And so I wouldn't, you know, give yeah. up, you know, hope that, you know, that you will find that community that helps you reconnect with God, you know? And yeah, and... I do think though that, um, I mean, one of the things Christ does is he recontextualizes our world, like right? he tells us what's true about it. And I think sometimes our vision needs to get healed in order to allow us to get into relationship with others again. I mean, I had a friend who, um, was married for quite a while and uh and his spouse cheated on him um for like a year without his knowledge um and um i remember him telling me like just looking at my spouse is like repulsive to me like i it's, it's one thing you know to academically say i would like to reconcile with my wife but he couldn't physically be in the room with her because it was just he wasn't there yet, right? And I, I think that can feel like that for some people with the church. Like, you want to go back, you can see the logic and I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but you you just can't do it. Um, and for people like that, I think Jesus needs to do some healing in that respect. Uh, rather than sort of try to force yourself, Christ needs to help you to see others as he sees them. Right, maybe not necessarily the offending person, but you know the people, the the collateral damage of that situation. In the church, please. Sorry, my dog is working. Had an opportunity. Sounds very. Uh, Did you hear that dog barking? It's like digital. It's like. <laughs> oh, there we go. That was clear. Um, that's my emergency fake electronic dog when I get a hard question. I can explain. Yeah, it's just like, oh, I got to deal with the dog. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. um, somebody asks, um, this is kind of getting back to the, the society question. Mm -hmm. um, so they were involved in Alpha. Um, and recently, um, the, everything's good, um, but the stumbling block ends up being Jesus and the exclusivity of oh, Jesus yeah. as being the, the way. Um, yeah. Uh, how do you, how do you kind of enter into that kind of conversation where, again, here we're, you're, you're dealing in a, a pluralistic society yeah. where, you know, we, we respect other people's beliefs and, and mm -hmm. value other people. Um, and, everybody's making claims that their religion is, you know, the best and is noble and, and, uh, and yeah. leads to uh, a flourishing life and better societies. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is, is the claims of, of Jesus as being the way, you know, offensive or right, or yeah. how do you kind of navigate that? Um, By the way, I just want to tell everyone, Steve was like, before this, like, you're going to get some hard questions, you know, tonight. These people ask really tough questions. He didn't say, like, he would be doing all the hard question asking, but thank you for that. I'm editorializing them just to add a little bit of edge to it. So, you know, <laughs> no. Right. I haven't even got to my questions yet, Justin. I, I've got a whole list here. This is just the warm-up, so. Uh, all right. Um, 
Well, there's a theological aspect to that question, and there's an ethical aspect to that question. Um, the theological aspect is, do I believe, in fact, that Jesus is the way, truth, and the life? And if the answer to that is yes, which it is for me, the next question is, what do I, how do I act in light of that? And uh, the second question is easier, theoretically, if not in practice. And what do I do as a Christian who has an exclusive claim to the Lordship of Christ? Well, I love my neighbor as myself. And I, um, I take the posture that Jesus had for the world, which is I die for the world. Um, I, I, I love sacrificially uh, and I'm a good neighbor to people. I mean, I have to think about this in the university, right? So now I, I work in a, in a theological college, but it's a part of the university. And um, the question is, you know, what's the role of theology in the university? Because, you know, if you know your history, we used to be in charge, us theologians. It was a golden era, right? We were in charge of everything. Uh, administratively, I'm sure it was a disaster, but we were in charge. The theologians ran everything, um, but it's not like that anymore, right? Now we are just another member, right? We're another flat in the building of the university. And um, uh, theologians have kicked around, what do we do? Should we try to take over again? Should we bow to the, the prevailing... Um, ideology of the university and my response to that is i think i think we just have to be good neighbors right if i'm here i'm going to love my neighbors that doesn't mean you know being a doormat and not engaging and dialoguing but um but my first question is how do i serve this person not how do i win um, not how do i colonize this world for christ as a christian i think the world already is christ's Right? I'm not competing for space here. I don't have to be afraid. I'm not competing in a marketplace. I'm bearing witness to my Lord in the world. Um, so that's how I would, I would do it, um, practically speaking. And I think even if I did, if let's say I was a straight up pluralist and thought there's no truth and Jesus is just one of many ways, if I wasn't doing the love my neighbor thing, that pluralism doesn't solve anything, right? Um, a, a pluralist who's a jerk uh, isn't really great and hospitable. They're just participating in the, the endless um, conflict of the faculties as Immanuel Kant said. That was a rambling response, but there you go. Well, this kind of ties into another question we got uh, in the chat. Um, would you say that what we actually do is what we actually believe? Uh, yeah. If we don't do it, we don't believe it. What, what's kind uh, of what, what's kind of the yeah? Um, relationship? I mean, I hope not. I hope not. Um, I can see what that how that could be a prophetically kind of powerful thing to say. Um, how do you how do you read Rome? It's Romans seven, right? Where Paul. The, you know, yeah, so the things I don't want to do, I do. I do what I don't want to do. You know, like yeah. How do you how do you read that? Like, I, you know, I mean, I think there's some there's there's obviously some truth in that, right? If someone is, um, well, think of all the Christian leaders who preach like sexual purity while they're secretly engaging in sexual sin, right? Um, uh, so there's there's something to the extent with like were they really. What was what, what function were their beliefs having in their lives when it had no effect uh, in what they actually did on a day to day basis? Um, I mean, they might even say they still believe what they were saying; they just weren't living up to what they believed. Um, but even so, what again? What's the point of the belief? Um, on the other hand, uh, because I have a strong doctrine of sin, I think. Um, in some respects, we are never able to live up to our ideals, no matter what our ideals are. Um, I think we are striving towards the convergence of the things we say and the things we do. Um, but again, with respect to what I said earlier, I think there is no real distinction between the things we say and the things we do because the things we think and say are a species of doing <laughs> in my mind. Right, so we're looking for 
consistency in our lives in all respects. Um, so I think a person that believes Jesus is Lord um, and yet does not love their neighbor is not a good thing. But believing Jesus is Lord is not a waste. Um, you know, as, as St. John says, um, we're halfway there living out of prayer, right? Um, St. John Bon Jovi. Um, so yeah, I'll take a good belief and I'll also take a good action, um, but we're, 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 we want some kind of synthesis and convergence between them ultimately. And there's some kind of dialectic between the two, right? Yeah. Just, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I can celebrate, I mean, Christians can celebrate things. We can be like, isn't it great that this atheist is fighting for, you know, eradicating world hunger? I don't have to be like, it doesn't count because they're not a Christian. Um, and likewise, if someone is a hypocrite, um, I mean, there's so many theologians who made, prob you know, errors in their moral judgment that um, nevertheless still still open up something of Christianity to the rest of their brothers and sisters in the church. You just got to be that's honest. A, okay. That's an interesting point. I'll bring no, up. Don't do it. Story. Don't do it, Steve. Don't do it. Yeah, do it. I'm going to do it. <laughs> you walked into that. <laughs> so uh, one of Justin's first uh, Facebook posts as a staff. Um, so I'll explain the story and we can, uh, we can talk uh, about this a little bit. Um, so uh, somebody donated a big box of theological books to Wycliffe to give away to students. And uh, I received said box on the, on the steps of the college. And there was probably, I'd say like 10 uh, Yoder books. And uh, if people don't know the story, he, uh, he, uh, John Howard Yoder, the Anabaptist yeah. theologian. Yeah. yeah, the uh, Yoder, Yoder was, uh, was found out later that he was a predator, um, serial predator, and he, he had kind of groomed people, and it was a really terrible, you know, situation. Um, and so when I saw those books, I was just like, I, I'm not going to give them out. So I tossed, tossed them in the garbage that was sitting there. And then I noticed like the next day, Justin had posted on Facebook saying, oh, this is a pretty strong statement with a picture of all these books in the garbage. And so, yeah, I, I'm interested in, in chatting that through a little bit. You know, did I make the right call? You know, um, I can, uh, why don't you, you say first, like what you thought when you kind of saw them there and I can kind of go through my thought process and we can kind of um, see. Yeah. All right. So this is, this is the question, right? There's theologians that have done horrific things. And the question is always, what is the threshold? Like, uh, I mean, basically it's a question of canceling. Like when do you actually cancel someone um, in the parlance of our time? Um, and uh, in his case, I mean, it was a pretty horrific crime. Um, I, well, I'll, put, I'll speak abstractly because I don't want to comment on that particular case. For me, the question is, for me, the question is, um, were they writing their theology in order to justify that immoral behavior, right? In other words, uh, I mean, a really simple example would be, um, you know, theologians in the 19th century who wrote theological anthropology specifically to justify the practice of slavery, uh, race-based slavery. Um, you know, there it, it becomes clear when you read some of this stuff that what they were doing was an after-the-fact self-justification for their practice, uh, and therefore it makes it makes their theology quite suspect because you don't know how deep the rock goes. Um, uh, there's other theologians who, who had moral failings, but sort of wrote truthfully despite that, I guess. 
Um, in all cases, I mean, in all cases, you're not supposed to celebrate people anyway. You know, um, we get we we get obsessed with this in Christian world. We're like, uh, this, this person has not only said something really interesting; they're also uh, the reincarnation of Saint Paul um, or something, right? They're like amazing, the most godly, amazing person ever, and and um, um, yeah, yeah, good point, Joe. <laughs> Um, we do have a fireplace. I should put my bin on my desktop over there and I can just do that turn stuff files in there. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's well, a like, even like in our own Bible, right? You have David, right? Like, he, yeah, it's at some level, he would not meet the standards, you know, yeah. of Goodbye, our society. Psalm 23. Yeah, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. I, like I struggle with it to be honest. Like, I like, I kind of like at this, like some of these books you know, and we can just make a list. Yes, yeah, yeah. there's been many people that have failed, you know, morally, like Ravi yeah. Zacharias recently, all these, you know, people that have really, I'd, I'd say argued have done a lot of great things for the kingdom. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard, because, you know, on one level, you're just, yeah, can you want to separate out, you know, like, oh, the words that they wrote. And yeah. part of my, my thinking was like, was the person repentant, you know, at all, you know, like this was like a struggle that, you know, everybody has struggles, everybody sins, yeah. you know. Um, um, yeah. And I mean, also the, um, um, I mean, I want to know yeah. if uh, sometimes people will say, I mean, so you'll see, um, uh, if, if there's most people are not the only unique voice saying that thing, yeah. right? You know, it's like, uh, oh, this poor white man got canceled for making a racist Twitter joke. Does that mean we have to throw him out? Well, chances are there's probably someone that's not racist also saying smart things somewhere. So it's not like we're utterly reliant on singular individuals to say things, you know? Um, I mean, this always happens with books and stuff. Like, why do we have to get the, the, the horrible people uh, in the table of contents of your book, you know, usually the answer is, well, we couldn't find anyone else who was as qualified. Like, well, that's BS, right? Like, you can always find someone who's not a, a predator to write your chapter on sexual ethics, right? Uh, if you really wanted to, if you took the time to care, and if you broadened your constituency a little bit more. Um, there are sometimes, though, people that, like Thomas Aquinas, right, has shaped, a, like, nearly a thousand years of of church reflection and um it's tough to excise that at this point um you don't excuse things but you sort of have to deal with the reality of it um you don't celebrate it you know like i wouldn't build a uh, it's like the, de the debate about statues and things that are going on right now um uh I do, I'm in favor of getting rid of statues because they celebrate things rather than just learning from them, right? I would say, but before I uh, start a battle, let's move on to the next topic. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it would be interesting to get some yeah. presentation. Yeah. Uh, like if, if you were faced with the same situation, um, like yeah. would you have thrown out John Howard Yoder's books? And I mean, I will. I mean, I will say I don't use Yoder's books in my classes anymore. So there's a practical answer. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I couldn't do that knowing that there were students in my classes who potentially were victims themselves. I, I couldn't make them read that. Um, so that's just a decision I made. Um, hey, can we flip a poll up? Just to oh, see. A cancel poll? Yeah, I, I'm interested. You know, it's, uh, yeah, uh, it's a hard thing to do, right? It's, uh, it's not, it's not a, or maybe it's not a hard thing to do. I... <laughs> oh, dear. Hosts and panelists can't vote, so. Okay. We'll give you guys a few seconds. We'll see about that. Yeah, 
John Vanier, you know, that was another recent, yeah, uh, recent one as well. So, yeah, I mean, there's a friend of mine who uh, who wrote a book um, talking about sort of seri a series of older sort of Christian leaders and had Vanier in there and he went to visit with him and stuff. And then all his stuff came to light and they just released a second edition of the book. Vanier. And, um, uh, and I think there's, I think they did a podcast. It's, it's Kyle Strobel and um, I can't remember the other guy cause I'm not friends with him, but he's also probably great. But uh, they wrote a book on this and they think they did a podcast explaining their rationale for removing that chapter from the book, if you can find it. Ooh. Wow, that's, that's fascinating. It looks like the the uh, the liberal government is still intact. Right now, yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't know if, if every it's di displayed for everybody, but it's about half and half. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, there's a comment from Janet there. Yeah. I can see, um, I can see that. Um, it's always sad though, when these people go down because they take down the whole apparatus around them. Uh, you know, I've had friends work for Ravi's group that were great, great people. And, um, you know, what he, he didn't just lose his own reputation. He took down other things too. It's, it's quite sad. Yeah, we, we worked a lot with RZIM on events over the last four or five years. So it was, it was pretty tough, you know, to see some really great people, you know. And the Larsh communities, right? I mean, yeah. amazing places, the Larsh community. That's John Vanier's ministry. And um, it's a shame, you know, that. Well, let's talk a little bit about this kind of celebrity culture in Christianity. I, I know you alluded to that before where, we shouldn't be elevating people or those things. Like at some level, you know, RZIM got as big as it got, or Larsh got as prominent as it got because of the the profile of their leader leaders, right? Um, like what? Like is this antithetical to kind of how Christianity should kind of grow and emerge? You know, or is there a role for celebrity, you know, for the sake of the gospel? I don't know. What what are kind of some of your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm reminded of Paul, who's like, you know, what's Paul, what's Apollos? <laughs> you know, we, we do little jobs, but it's God who makes it grow. Um, but like when Paul is coming through town, like people weren't like, oh, it's just some other guy. You know what I mean? Like he probably caused a little bit of a, you know, yeah, once or twice, once or twice he caused a stir. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a double whammy because people love the praise and adulation of others, and then we love um, uh, putting people on pedestals, right? So, uh, as I sometimes say when I in my lecture on sin, um, you know, humans gonna hume, like we do, <laughs> we do human things. And um, and Christians are not uh, immune to that problem as well. But uh, I do think um, sometimes you are not. Uh, if you know people like that, if you know famous people in the Christian world or even just in general, you got to look out for these brothers and sisters, you know. Um, in fact, when I going back to the previous topic, I think most. Most of the people that have these big falls that I can think of, the big famous people, got themselves into a position where they couldn't, where they were not letting people speak into their lives, or, uh, or people were hesitant to speak into their lives. Um, put another way, we are not being the church to one another, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I can think of all sorts of situations where this happened. I mean, the, one of my favorite theologians, we don't have to get into it, Steve, but one of my favorite theologians had a moral <laughs> we, we issue. We don't name names. And, uh, 
and he um, and I people have asked me what do I think about this, and I always think uh, I looked at at this this genderless person's um, uh, church life, you know, and what did I discover? Um, somewhat sporadic, and this person was such a big deal that I mean, when you go to church, right, you should be under the word of God right? You shouldn't be the famous theologian in the pew that the preacher is scared to talk in front of, right? You are the one being laid bare by the word of God. And if you, if you don't let yourself do that, it's really hard for the church to do its church thing, which is build one another up in Christ, you know, call each other out, restore one another gently, all the stuff that Paul says in conflict. Um, uh, and, and in that respect, uh, we all kind of bear some of the blame for this stuff in, cer in certain respects, not in all respects, but in certain respects, we got to look out for one another. And it's easy for us to elevate someone famous and enjoy the explosive growth of our church on the back of that. Um, but are we, we're not serving ourselves and we're not serving that person that we put in that position, I think. Um, so yeah, I would look out for that stuff. Yeah, it was a, we had a Richard Foster here probably about five, six years ago. And I was mm. chatting with him a little bit. And he was saying how him and Dallas Willard went to church together in a church of like 200 people. And it just like blew my mind. And they were just like guys in the church. And I was like, that's, yeah, it was cool, but also like unexpected, I guess. Yeah. Um, and you need, you need people to dress you down also. Yeah. In fact, and uh, okay, I can't read the audience and what kind of people you are, but as I just came here from Britain and I just got <laughs> an hour before this, right, where I put on my speaking jacket and try to sound theological and all that, I got an email from five or six of my friends in Britain uh, or a, a video they sent to me of them just incessantly mocking me for 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, it's good to feel loved every once in a while. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're all getting together tonight and, you know, having their theology pub and, uh, or just pub. And they're like, we're going to send a video to Justin. Justin, you idiot, you suck, you know. And yeah. sometimes you need people like that in your life, you know, to keep it real. You got to keep it real. That's Christian talk. So I wanted to take a flip of this. I, this is going way different area than I thought it was going to go, but oh well. I think All right, good. freedom and sovereignty. Uh, yeah. Okay, what? Yeah, exactly. Um, no, uh, so um, kind of like on the, on the opposite side of this, you know, no accountability, the leader was basically unchecked, unfettered, you know, hid all these things, you know, from everyone else. There's the, the flip of that is kind of like the Billy Graham rule, you know, like the Oh you know, yeah, you know, like this, this kind of like hyper, yeah, um, this hyper carefulness. Like I, I remember, I worked for Power to Change or Campus Crusade for uh, five years, and like it was always like ingrained, like you need to be above reproach. You don't want to meet with, you know, a person of the opposite sex alone. You don't want to, yeah. you know, like just make the list. And the intention was to kind of protect uh your integrity and that person's integrity mm. but I've, I've had a or you, okay you can add i'm just gonna finish first and then i think, I think the first part is what people's on people's mind more but yeah, yeah. but uh um but uh yeah part of it in co later conversations i've had in life too is like it's really robbed us of an opportunity to like interact human to human you know yeah. and so um, yeah, what are your, your kind of thoughts? And I guess you kind of came out of that, you know, yeah. background to some degree as well. Um, yeah. Um, oh, I wish I was, a, <laughs> I was gonna say, I wish I was a woman, but, uh, uh, I want to hear from women on this, especially because this is, this is where I've learned a lot, um, from women, because as a guy growing up in sort of a conservative place, I thought, how holy and godly I am for caring about this, you know, that I will never be alone with a woman and all that, the sort of Mike Pence rule and, J and Billy Graham rule. Um, then you start talking to some women and they're like, 
uh, that makes me feel horrible to hear guys say that. Uh, it, it makes me feel like I'm not a human being. It makes me feel like I'm nothing but a temptress, et cetera. And half of the time they're grossed out by us anyway. So it's not even like um, accurate, but um, yeah, I, I, in seminary in particular, talking to my um, women colleagues in seminary and some of the women professors opened my eyes to that. And um, when I got it, I mean, that doesn't mean be stupid, right? I'm not saying like, I am cool enough with hanging out with women that we're going to go to my hot tub after class and hang out. No, don't do that. But um, uh, it really, I don't know. I, I want to respect people as people. Um, and um, I don't know, I just, I've been taught by a lot of women on that issue and I'm really, I'm almost more sensitive now to making them feel like, um, this is as a guy thing, but making them feel like uh, they're not actually a human being, have a, con a conversation with a human being, but an occasion for sin, which is just unfair, I think. But again, that's what I've learned from them. So they're the experts, they can teach us, not me. Um, yeah, Robert made a comment, how far back do we go? Uh, Martin Luther had some very anti-Semitic comments, yeah. you know, um, yeah. do we throw him out too? Yeah, it's just, a, it's a tough, tough. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can't, I remember one time I was at a conference and um, one of these kind of like uber reformed in the American sense conference, so like not actually Galvinist, but they really like tulip and things. And um, and uh, I was talking with this guy about Jonathan Edwards, whose star has risen in that particular movement and um, the subject of Jonathan Edwards' slave ownership came up. And, you know, I was like, you know, much like we're discussing now, I was like, what do you guys, what do you think of that person? And he said, well, it's okay but uh, because God used Jonathan Edwards owning those fellow human beings in order to share the gospel with them. Like, you know, and I thought, no, no, right? Uh, in order to say we can still, Jonathan, still read Jonathan Edwards, we don't say his slavery was especially good slavery. We say that was wrong. <laughs> Nevertheless, I think he said some smart things about the will or the religious affections, right? So you don't, and same thing with Luther, you don't say like, well, his anti-Semitism was not as bad as, no, you'd be like, he should not have said that. That is sinful, what he said, right? So just call this stuff out. You don't need to defend everything about everybody. Um, and in fact, that can, I think, exacerbate the problem, right? Don't let your respect for someone blind you to their failings. I think. Hmm. All yeah, right. Good, good comment from Claire there. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, it's it's. I want to I want to get there. It's it's hard. I we we. I have a couple female friends that we we've actually had this conversation a few times in the last while, and it's it's a I, I oscillate. You know what I mean? Like it's. Uh, it's very ingrained in my uh, upbringing. And so it's- uh, I mean, we do it with other, you gotta take risks when you're loving people. Like that's, uh, you know, it's like uh, giving money to, um, to folks that are not living in a house, right? Like on the street, um, you know, people will be like, well, they might go spend it on smack or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, that's the risk. Like you, you, there's always a risk, I mean, in loving people. Right, you're gonna put yourself on. You're gonna make yourself vulnerable. Uh, and yeah, you know, I might, if I if I can, if, if I can have a, a lifetime of ministry to, to um, to people, including women, who I need to sort of show love and compassion to. Uh, and the price for that is me getting falsely accused, you know, of doing something. Then so be it. You know, I'm not going to live in total fear of the risk of love um, because of that. Because then, who are you really looking at for? <laughs> you know, uh, that's not the self-sacrificial posture that Jesus um, took. Right. In fact, um, I, I seem to recall he got in trouble for uh, for hanging out with the wrong types of people. Yeah. 
All right, here's a, a anonymous question. Uh, what do you think of the popular characteristic of Anglican, Anglicanism as the middle way? Or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe a big tent Anglicanism. Um, does this lens affect your own theological study? Well, you know, originally the Via Media, the middle way, is from the 16th century when they were fighting between the Catholics and the Puritans and things like that. So Anglicanism is supposed to be a middle way of uh, you can keep all your vestments, you can do all your bishopy stuff, you can walk around with big crosses and all of that and believe in justification by grace through faith and certain views of the Eucharist and all of that. So that was Elizabeth Wan's big uh, and other people like Richard Hooker's big um, win for Anglicanism. That, did, uh, that said, Anglicanism has sort of pendulum swung all the way back and forth uh, many times. So it was really Protestant and then it sort of regained its Catholic heritage in the early 19th century and the Oxford movement and others. And now I think Anglicanism is, is probably more realistically what Hooker was talking about, which is there's space for everybody. Um, um, I mean, it was an attractive environment for me as a theologian because I liked the idea of putting myself in a fellowship where I'm going to have to listen to lots of different perspectives and voices and approaches. So I found it like a fruitful place to, for one, studying theology. Um, uh, I think that by the time I got involved with Anglicanism, it was a global phenomenon. Um, maybe not necessarily, we didn't get to that phenomenon for the best of reasons, i.e. colonialism, but now that we're here, it's an opportunity for me to listen to non-white, non-Western voices. Um, that's a really cool benefit of the denomination. Um, so yeah, it's it's middle way in that sense of kind of a brokered piece between all different kinds of traditions in one place. I mean, it used to be that we were all united by common practice or common liturgy, but uh, as I've discovered, having just moved from England to Canada, that's probably not even true because you guys, the liturgy is weird, I've discovered. It's all slightly different and it's frustrating. So I have to relearn everything, but um, uh, we should all just be doing the 1662 prayer book if I was in charge, but that's me. But yeah, that's, it's, it's an interesting denomination. It can be frustrating for all the reasons I mentioned and encouraging for all the reasons I mentioned. Yeah. All the lines there. So does uh, anybody from the audience have some other themes we have? The, the humble expert here with us. Um, and so, so like, okay, maybe I'll, but while we're waiting for some more questions, um, what, like going back full circle in your life, you know, to your mm -hmm. music days, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about in their life, like connecting the dots, but you only see the dots connected looking retrospectively, you know? So like, mm -hmm. in what way was God kind of shaping the trajectory of your, you know, life and your theological outlook and how did like your music kind of um, build or how did you build on that kind of foundation, you know, as you've kind of entered now or what did maybe yeah. music teach you implicitly, you know, about <laughs> theology? I don't know, man. I, I don't know if I'm that intentional about it. I just love music. Um, I know there are some theologians that try to like explain theology through music uh, yeah. and, and stuff. And, um, and I, I respect that. Uh, but for me, I, it's just, it's just constantly going on in my head. <laughs> so it's, it's just there. Um, and, well, let me flip then, if that's yeah. not exciting. Yeah. What about like, a lot of people, you know, wrestle with doubt and stuff, you know, at different points in their... Not me. I know. Not me at all. Yeah. No, I... So I'm, I'm very interested in that question because uh, I think sometimes like people will look to leaders and this, this again, 
kind of gets back to your whole stage pedestal piece where you're, you know, as a theologian, as a worship pastor, as a, you know, a, a priest or whatever, or as a teacher, you, you can't, you're not allowed the freedom to, you know, explore doubt. And there's that um, expectation that you've got it all figured out, you know, how, how is that kind of dynamic kind of played out in your life? And like, so what are some of the questions that were really hard, you know, for you as you kind of journeyed through this whole thing? And, you know, yeah. is there, is there things that are still kind of unsettled? Like I, I, I'm mostly there, you know, but I'm still not quite mm -hmm. sure, you know. Um, it's, I mean, it's very, um, I wish we could be more honest about this stuff. Um, I mean, that said, I'm, I'm not one of these people that says the past, that likes when the pastor get up there and says, you know what, like, I've been really struggling. Like, no, when the pastor's up there, they're supposed to preach the word of God and not share their personal experiences, but that's for another time. Um, but with, with one another, I mean, Bonhoeffer says uh, in his book, Life Together, you know, the church should be the one place where you should be comfortable to be a sinner. Uh, you know, like, um, it's the one place where you can be honest, right? Everywhere else, we have to sort of keep up appearances. The church is the place where you should come and confess that you are um, a sinner and confess to one another that you have sinned and, you know, receive forgiveness and all that. So um, I do think we need to be honest. I mean, for me, the biggest thing that caused me to doubt um, growing up in the faith and even into my adult years was, uh, I guess, just measuring myself against other people's experiences. Um, you know, I'm not like other people and the way they describe their faith and their relationship with Christ oftentimes did not resonate with me to the point where I thought, does that mean that I'm not really experiencing what Christianity is? You know, so like uh, you go to church and you see people that are just so into it in whatever denomination you're a part of and whatever what that looks like, they're just super into it. And I just never felt that way. Um, and, uh, you know, for a long time, I thought that means I'm not, I'm like faking it or something. And I had yeah, to make- I'm not, I'm not really a Christian, you know, yeah. because obviously I'd be feeling more if I- yeah. Yeah, you know, you pick up your Bible and people are like, whoa, this is amazing. God's speaking to me. And I'm like, what? It's just Psalm 23. I've read that like a million times. You know, I, I don't, I didn't, I didn't, I just had to learn my personality wasn't the same as others. And the way I connected with God wasn't like the way other people did. Um, and that really freed me. And now I, uh, um, I still struggle with that, but um, and that causes a lot of doubt, right? Because you look to other people for confirmation about you're doing it right. Um, and uh, and that can be confusing sometimes if if you find differences. So that's caused me a lot of, of doubt. Can I answer like Ryan's question here? Yeah. Can we, sorry, I don't know. When do I get to see everybody? Oh, we can, uh, we'll, we'll go like five more minutes and then we'll okay. just open it up, so. All right, that also might cause everyone to leave, but. Um, how can we as pastor theologians approach and understand theology in a manner that promotes the unity of the body of Christ ecumenically rather than divides us over secondary differences? Um, uh, you got to, as I kind of was what I was saying before, is you got to think of theology as a following after Christ rather than a defense of your team. So, if you're like a uh, Baptist or a Presbyterian and you're like the point of theology is for me to, sh to show the superiority of Baptist theology or Presbyterian theology or whatever, then, uh, and I think your congregation will pick up on that. If it's just rah, rah, triumphalistic, we're right, they're wrong um, stuff, then you're gonna produce Christians who are like that, who are going to not trust other Christians in any way um have you been uh, listening to the mars hill podcast series yeah all? yeah i did 
I listen yeah, to. Yeah, because there's that that one thread that I I really latched onto that around that idea where you know like there's churches that grow kind of have this kind of common theme where we've got it figured out, you know, and yeah. come come find and experience the true Christianity, you know, so to speak, yeah. and um, and this confidence is attractive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've met people like that who, uh, I went to a uh, conference once that was on my seminary's campus because they would rent out, you know, the, the campus. And it was these really, really niche Christians who believe something very specific about eschatology that I won't go into. And, um, and I went there and I'm like in seminary studying for my MDiv, working at a church. And basically I realized talking to this guy, uh, during one of the breaks that he was witnessing to me like he was evangelizing me like trying to get me to accept Jesus as my lord and savior in a specific way because in his mind I wasn't part of his particular movement ergo I wasn't a Christian ergo he needs to save me uh and um yeah it was very jarring um because from my perspective you know I knew they were very niche but in my my attitude was like, okay, they're very strange and very unique, but maybe I can learn something from them because they're my Christian brothers and sisters. I want to go there and hear what they have to say. Their perspective on me was, here's this even <laughs> coming from another church, uh, which can't be a real church. So we're going to try and save him. Um, and, um, you know, you got to watch out for that. I, I That's not an argument for mishmash, like where you're just saying nobody can believe anything specific. Um, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I, that dream that some people have of a universal church now, prior to the, the, um, the eschaton, um, I don't think would be a good thing, right? We'll, let's imagine all the, the divisions are gone and we end up being all Roman Catholic again, um, whatever that might mean. Um, I always say, look, you know, I don't want to be in a world of universal Roman Catholicism, but I also don't want to live in a world where there's no Roman Catholicism, <laughs> you know, just like I don't want to, you know, live in a world where we Anglicans win, right, but I do think that the, it's good that the Anglicans are there, yeah, you know, and it's good that the Baptists are there, and it's good that the Pentecostals are there, and stuff. Um, we are each trying to follow Christ, and we are sort of holding each other as different churches accountable in our own unique ways to that task, I think. So we need to listen. This is a very Protestant account of the different denominations, by the way, right? And in some sense, Protestants have to say it's good that there's different approaches, right? Otherwise, we're all in trouble. And we very well might be, who knows? But um, uh, but my view is, um, yeah, you got to view the the church down the road that's a different denomination as as a brother or sister in arms with you, you got to help each other out. Yeah, that story is really funny. It made me remember something that happened. I think it was my second year here, actually. Uh, two guys walked in off the street. And I can't even remember what they were they were talking about exactly. But I do remember, like, I was sitting with a couple other doctoral students, and we were... Um, we were chatting with these guys and they were just convinced that we knew nothing about the Bible or anything and that th they were there to like help save us. Like they walked into a, a seminary yeah. to like, you know, save us from ourselves, you know, yeah. and there was a, a deep dis suspicion, you know, that our education had misled us and it was a fascinating conversation. And yeah, I like the first level of like, you know, your elitism, you know, like, oh, I've like studied Hebrew and Greek and, you know, like, you don't even know what these words are. But then like under underneath it, there was just like, wow, like these guys are just really sincere and like they really believe that we yeah. are, you know, on the wrong path. And uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, ooh, right, Ryan, Ryan's killing it with the questions here. Uh, uh, one of the significant themes in the New Testament epistles is false teaching, yes. Um, false teachers don't realize or think they're false teachers. Some of them, 
Um, <laughs> some are straight up charlatans. Um, but yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, so by, by what I'm saying about we all have to listen to each other, uh, we listen to each other, again, for the sake of truth, right? So that means I'm assuming that uh, we all, in, to the extent that we all have something right, we also have something wrong, right? And, um, and that's why repentance is a part of theology. Uh, and it's why accountability is a part of theology. So if someone is teaching falsely, uh, it's, it's, it's important for us to call it out. Um, but not for the sake of winning, right? And um, and the church hasn't always got this right. Even the good guys, uh, Athanasius, right? One of my heroes, fourth century church father, who sort of helped the doctrine of the Trinity get... Uh, get and you just like him because he's Greek, but that's just my theory. But anyways. Well, yeah, obviously he's, he's the greatest nationality ever. But um, But also he was like a jerk. And he wanted to win, right? He like what he got kicked out of the empire every time there was an Aryan uh, emperor. But as soon as there was a, a a Nicene emperor, he was right back in, and he was persecuting the other side, right? Um, that's not what I'm talking about, right? You're not calling out false. And he was right; those were false teachers, right? They were, by definition, heretics. A lot of them. Um, uh, but you you fight false teaching for the sake of the truth, not for the sake of winning or gaining market share and all of that sort of thing. And hopefully, um, even sometimes the uh, I'm talking the the non malicious false teachers um, might have heard something of the spirit that you need to hear. Right. This is one of the reasons why I study all kinds of theology. Right. So. Um, this is, I did learn from Karl Barth, one of my favorite theologians, uh, who kept, even though he hated Protestant liberal theology, continued to read and take it seriously, because he's like, yeah, this is like 98% wrong, but to the extent that Christ has not abandoned his church, there still might be something for me to hear here, so I have to keep listening. Um, it's for the sake of the truth and for the sake of Christ that you keep an open mind. Yeah, and that's a scriptural theme, hey? You know, it's, you know, it's, yeah. Well, uh, why don't we wrap up and say thanks for coming, but then we'll uh, make everybody live and we can keep the conversation going as long as Justin wants to stick around. But uh, yeah, thanks for being willing to chat for a bit. I think it was an interesting conversation. We'll, we'll do a part two sometime in person when we can... Yes. Uh, and you have, can buy me a beer. That would be good. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, yeah, we'll do our best.